Talk Shoes. Recorded live. All right, welcome everybody. This is Matthew, and you are on the Free Americans. The Free Americans. And we are talking about NTT tonight. NTT is making payments under trust. NTT is merging titles and extinguishing debt. Welcome to the call. Before we get started, I'm going to read our notice acknowledgement agreement for our special guest, Christian Walter. This show and our acknowledgement. The show and or documents are private and not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for individual legal situation or employed for making legal decisions. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure. It is not a substitute for legal advice or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show or documents are for academic informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walter. By accessing or reviewing this show and using the documents therein, you understand what the agreement that with all rights reserved without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida, or any other state has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind produced by non-attorneys, or pro state parties in the preparation and use of the hearing reference, and has no interest in any issue referenced therein is not a party to this or any action arising from is only acting in an authorized capacity as lays on the communication between the parties. By reading in or using this information, you acknowledge and agree that you are not a client of Christian Walters. These documents and show recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached here by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for amnesty commercial damages of $100 million or more per sulcification or impairment per Christian Walters' discretion. Thank you for your understanding. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are in a practical treaty on the law of trust, and tonight we're starting on page 7. 74. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christian. I want to go ahead and uh, get to your place in the book. Christian, can you hear me? Yes, Matt. Thanks. All right. You got the floor. It's all yours. Okay. As Matt said, 774 is the page we're starting on, and it's under Chapter 23, The Powers of Trustees. Right off the bat, it says, The powers of trustees are either general or special. General or special. That That is really the whole key right there. Of everything I've been talking about since NTT debuted on 7, or 11-7 of uh, 2009, that everything is really either general or public or special, which is private. And the understanding of those two realms, public versus private, is the key to the understanding of this whole thing. And that kind of ties in with some thorns in my side, really, with some stuff that is floating around with this new takeoff of trust, which is this executor letter in an estate. And the big... For, for, for those of you that have been following me for all this time, should know, but in case you don't know, it really comes back to, in the Lewin book here, we've been talking about ever since the beginning on the first 19 pages, which is just the basics. And people are sucking this stuff up that is nothing more than crap based on the fact that it sounds good to their itching ears and they are not basing it on any fact of anything. And if you've been following since we started the Lewin book here on the first 19 pages, I think it's like on page one or two, it gives the definition of the trust. To put it all in a nutshell, a trust is a relationship. Say that again. A trust is a relationship between three or more live people. Live people, not dead fictions. A trust has got nothing to do with dead fictions. A trust is a relationship between three or more live people. That is a key. There's all this garbage floating around here about trust. And it's got no basis it's standing on. 
It's just a bunch of gurus, and I respect the gurus for what I've learned from them, but I'm going to say this now. All those guys out there are totally 100% wrong. Quote my little article I got here. It says, talking about the courts, Says, my position on going to court has always been never voluntarily go to never voluntarily go to court. Live men and women are not meant to be in any place designed solely for the business of fictional entities. When we attend court, we are deemed dead. In fact, they cannot deal with us until we admit to being dead. Legal fiction, a trust. That is 100% totally wrong. A legal fiction, a trust, that violates all of thousands of years of trust history, written down from Lewin and going back to when trust first came into existence in 1200, mid-1200s. Written down, documented, a trust is not a legal fiction fiction. So in the opening paragraph of this article, the basis is wrong from the beginning. And from that point on, you will be wrong in everything that you come to conclusion with. Because your major premise contains a flaw from the beginning. And you will be off on all deductions from it. Let me say it again. A trust is a relationship between three or more live people. You can't have a relationship between dead entities. This stuff about being executors and estates, they got nothing to do with any knowledge about an executor and an estate. If you want to check it out, go to the CJS book on, a, on executors. It says in there that when a will on a decedent, and if we go back to Gilbert's, Gilbert says and explains and all the other books have been going through, it says in there that there's, there's methods of formation of a trust, and one of them the formation of a trust is by contract. The contract is the will, the will of the decedent forming a trust. And what is the purpose of that trust? To put it into probate. So there is a trust in an existence and a trustee on that trust. And at that moment, that trust is created, that trustee is a trustee, and he's also an executor on an estate, a dead decedent's estate. And the moment he files as trustee into probate, the purpose of the trust ceases to exist and the trust terminates. There is no longer a trustee or a trust from that moment on. And it becomes just an estate, and he is solely an, an, an executor, not a trustee an executor. All this BS floating around here is based on false knowledge, and everybody's sucking this up, and they're leading you down the debtor-creditor path on the wrong stuff because you're not checking out their sources. Buyer beware. Caveat emptor. The watchman on the wall says, I see the enemy. Pick up your sword and start watching. Start fighting. Because if you don't, your blood's on your hands. It's your duty to check out the facts. And when they don't put the facts in these stinking articles and they totally unsubstantiate them with anything, it's nothing more than hearsay upon hearsay. And everything I'm back at, saying on these, this show and other shows is backed up by fact, by something that I've given you to go check it out for yourselves, and you're not doing it. And anybody who's been here in any length of time and knows what I'm talking about, you need to tell these other people that are into this executor stuff that they're going down the wrong path. And caveat emptor, buyer beware, because you're totally off base, because you don't understand the basic elements of a trust a trust is not a legal fiction. 
In fact, you don't even have a trust on your birth certificate. It's nothing more than a birth certificate until you express it to be a trust. And when did you ever express your birth certificate to be a trust? So therefore, it is not a trust. It will never be a trust until you express it to be one. And then once you express it to be a trust, you must from that point on treat it as a trust. Section 161 in Book 90 of CJS on Trust. Check it out. I hate to see people misled, but it's your own choice. And I pick up this crap and people feed me this stuff of what they got and they think it looks good and it ain't worth the paper it's written on. Back to Lewins, Chapter 23, Powers of Trustee. The powers of the trustees are either general or special. The former, the general, such as by construction of law or incident to the office of trustee virtui officii. The latter, or special, such as are heard by terminorium, that is, the settler himself by an express proviso in the instrument creating the trust. Next, section one of the general powers of trustees. And it gives a footnote starting in one. And just for quick, we'll go through those footnotes and the general headings. Number one, the general powers of trustee. Next is the power to mortgage. Next is discretionary powers. Next is compromise by trustees. Next heading is various powers. Now this is the footnotes. And that footnote is number one. Now, number one, powers of trustees at law distinguished from their powers in equity. Let me read that again. Powers of trustee at law distinguished from their powers in equity. Tie that back up with that first paragraph I just read. The powers of trustees are either general or special. General is at law. Special is in equity, which it states in number one. Let me read it again. Number one, powers of trustees at law, that's general, distinguished from their powers in equity, that's special. The court of law, in a court of law, the trustee, as the absolute proprietor, may of course exercise all such powers as legal ownership confers, but in equity, the city key trust is the absolute owner. Get that? Absolute owner. That's the beneficiary, folks. And the question we have to consider in this place is how far the trustee may deal with the estate without rendering himself responsible in the form of the court of equity. Now, if that is a lawyer, he can't even enter into the court of equity. Because he's solely at law, and that's where his representation is, solely at law. Number two, general rule as powers of trustees is simple trust. With respect to simple trust, as a trustee is a mere passive depositary, he can in equity either take any part of the profits nor exercise any dominion or control over the corpus except at the instance of the city key trust. That's the beneficiary. Three, in special trust. In the special trust, the authority of the trustee is, as a general rule, and every time they say general, at law should come to mind, as a general rule, equally limited except so far as the execution of the trust itself may invest him with a proprietary power. And the duties thus prescribed to him and the trustee is bound strictly to pursue without swerving to the right hand or to the left. Now, there are exceptions. Number four, exceptions. But, under the particular circumstances, that's music to my ears, particular circumstances, the trustee is held capable of exercising the discretionary powers of a bona fide proprietor, but he's only got legal title with liability. Liability to the, the duty to perform according to the indenture to the city key trust, the beneficiary. Continuing on. For the trust estate itself might otherwise be injuriously affected. 
The necessity of the moment may demand immediate action while the sanction of the parties who are beneficially interested could not be procured without great inconvenience, as where the city key trusts are a numerous class, or perhaps could not be obtained at all. Let's go back up to the numerous class. All those people in Social Security, or all the people that are we the people, that's the numerous class. Or perhaps could not be obtained at all, as where the city key trusts are under a disability or not yet in existence. And that disability is you're all infants because you don't understand this is a trust and you never expressed it. Continue on. The alternative of consulting the court would always be attended with considerable expenses. And that it may be an expense wholly dis disportion to the importance of the occasion and perhaps in the meantime the opportunity might be lost. There is therefore eventually in furtherance of the city key trust's own interest that where the circumstances of the case require it, the trustee should be at liberty to exercise reasonable discretionary power. But the trustee for adults should not take any proceeding without consulting the city key trust. And if he do, and the proceeding is disavowed by them, he may have to pay the cost. Five, notice of trustee's intention to set a key trust. Well, the trust is not definite and precise, in which most of ours are, is because they're not they're loosely worded. They're not specifically worded as everything written down. Where the trust is not defi definite and precise, it would be doubtful what uh, what ought to be done under the trust. It's said that the trustee may give notice to the city key trust of his intention to do a particular act. And that unless the city key trust interferes to stop it, the court might well hold the trustee not to be liable for doing the act. Is the United States a trustee on this trust that's never been expressed? Asking the beneficiaries, or we the people, about whether or not they can do something or not? Absolutely. This crap about the birth certificate being held by the government and the government, the owner of it, is absolute nonsense. The owner is the one who put his signature on it. And your mother put her signature on there on behalf of the child. And the child put his signature on there by the footprint. That was his mark. And there was no objection. Six, the validity of the act without suit. It is a rule of equity that what is compellable by suit or would have been ordered by the court is equally valid if done by the trustee without suit, that is, without the sanction of the court. The difficulty with the trustee is to struggle is the danger of assuming that the court, on application to it, would review the matter in the same light with, the, with he regards it himself. So it's really the trustee's duty to check with the beneficiary if there's nothing specifically worded that he should check with the beneficiary so the beneficiary can okay it. And he doesn't have to go to the court. Seven, matter of form may be dispensed with. Trustees to avoid circuitry may dispense with forms. How about that? Form process and procedure? We can circuitry that? We can avoid it? the observance of which would only lead to expense. If, for instance, a transfer of sum of stock to secure the two trustees for the settlement, and they have the power by the settlement to sell out the fund and invest on mortgage, and they need not, they need not insist on a transfer of the stock and specie for the purpose of immediately selling out and investing the proceeds on mortgage, but if they have the mortgage readily made, readily made and make the value of the stock and hand it over to the mortgagor, so trustees have the power to lay out a certain sum at the purchase of an annuity for AB, may pay to the sum to AB direct without going through the form of purchasing an annuity. Eight, repairs. Where the legal state is vested in trustees and trust for one person for life, with the remainder over to others, it would be natural to suppose that the rights in equity, as between the tenant for life and the remainder men, would be the same as those at law between the legal tenant for life, and legal remainder man. It is, however, now clearly settled that whatever may be the legal liability of a legal tenant 
for life with respect to permissive waste, the trustee cannot, where it is no special clause of management, interfere with the possession of the equitable tenant for life who neglects the repair. Nine, legal rights, equitable rights. In other respects, the rights in equity must, it must be conceived, be governed by those at law. That's what equity says. Thus, a legal tenant for life may cut timber for the purpose of repairs, though he may not cut timber to sell it and apply to apply the produce or to repay himself the outlay in repairs. And similarly, the trustee may, it is conceived against the remainder man, cut timber for necessary repairs. If a tenant for life will consent to the application of income towards repairs and making use of the timber. The repairs by the tenant for life, however substantially substantial and lasting are his own voluntary act and do not arise from any obligation and he cannot claim any charge for them under the inheritance, upon inheritance. Next, repairs and improvements. Nor before the Settled Land Act of 1882 would the court at its instance direct lasting improvements to be made and though it was said by the court in one case that the rule might not be absolutely without exception as if it were a settled estate, and the fund directed to be laid out in the purchase of the same use, it might be more beneficial to the remainder man that part of the trust uh, phono would be applied to prevent building on the settled estate from going to destruction than that the whole should be laid out in the purchase of the lands, yet an extraordinary case was requisite to create such an exception. But where the trustee, having monies in the hands directed to be invested in lands to be strictly settled, entered into an agreement for purchase of an estate, but the farm building and cottages on the property were out of repair, the court sanctioned the application of a thousand pounds out of the monies in their hands in repairing, in repairing, improving, and rebuilding the farm buildings and cottages. Ten under the Settled Land Act. Now, by the Settled Land Act of 1882, Section 26, the tenant for life may, with approval of the trustees of the settlement or the approval of the court, as in the case may require, according to the money to be expended in his hands of the trustees or the court, expend any capital money arising under the Act and any of the improvements specified in Section 25 of the Act. And as under Section 59, an infant entitled to in possession to land is for the purpose of the act to be deemed tenant for life thereof. And by Section 60, the power of an infant tenant for life may be exercised on his behalf by the trustees of the settlement, or if there are none, by the nominee of the court. All power, all proper improvements may be effected under the act, notwithstanding the infancy of the beneficial owner. Generally, Independently of the power to settle land act, a trustee holding an estate for the benefit of a person absolutely entitled but incapable from infancy or otherwise to give directions may make necessary repairs, but he must go must not go beyond the necessity of the case by ornamental improvements or the expense will not be allowed. If the trustees will of a will were to permit the testator's son to have the use and enjoyment of a house were empowered during the son's occupation to make repairs, and Lord Romney, M.R., held that the trustees were to keep in the house in an inhabitable state, but not to make ornamental repairs. Where the mansion house was dilapidated in the date of the testator's will, and he empowered his trustees to keep all the buildings in good repair and to make such improvements by draining, walling, building, lining, or manuring, as they should think proper, The trustees have no power to rebuild the mansion house, but have the power to improve the estate by erecting farmhouses and outbuildings or by draining and planting. It was held that the trustees could erect agricultural cottages. And where the trustees of the terms for a thousand years were were specially authorized to keep the premise in good repair and generally superintend the management of the estate, the court held that the latter words confer a general power without limit that is, according to the discretion of the trustees and allowed the sums expended by them in erecting and repairing farmhouses and buildings, in draining, fencing, sinking wells, putting up pumps, constructing a bridge, and forming, repairing, and altering roads. If the trustees, without any special power to authorize it, lay out money in approving the estate, as in building a villa upon ground intended to be building ground, and which object they 
are advised will be prom- to be will be prom- prompted by the erection of the villa. They cannot justify the expenditure. But on the other hand, the city key trust cannot take the benefit and repudiate the whole outlay. But the trustee will be liable only for the loss to the estate. And where the mansion house has been burnt down and the trustee applied a large sum in addition to the insurance monies, in restoring the mansion house, the court was of the opinion that it had no jurisdiction to order a sale or mortgage of settled estates to raise the amount of the outlay or to authorize the expenditure for the restoration of the monies which were subject to the trust for reinvestment and land. But in appearing that the estate had been benefited by the full amount of certain funds in court which had arisen from the sale part of the settled estates, K.J. sanctioned the application of the funds towards recouping the trustee on the ground that the trustee, having bona fide, expended money for building on the estate under a reasonable expectation that the court should sanction the expenditure, and having improved the estate, the full amount of the funds in the court might be recouped the amount so expended. If the trustee made repairs out of the rents, and the trustees borrow the money to make the repairs, and then repay themselves out of the rents, they will not be allowed the interest on the money borrowed, for the trust was to apply the rents after they had occurred. Or crude. Twelve allowances to tenant for life, where trustees of a term are authorized to make the improvements on a trust property and to raise the sums required by mortgaging the inheritance comprising comprising the term, or out of the rents, issues, and profits, and subject to the term of the property strictly settled. The tenant for life is entitled to have the amount of income applied to the trustees and permanent improvements raised out of the corpus of the estates where there was no power to manage or cultivate the real estate and a farm was in hand and no tenant could be found, the court allowed 1,000 pounds, part of the personality which was held in the same trust as the realty, to be advanced to the tenant for life, who was one of the trustees. On his bond, he he undertaking to expend it in stocking, taking, and cultivating the farm to satisfaction of co-trustee. 13. Land Improvement Act. By the Land Improvement Act of 1864, trustees in the actual possession or receipt of rents or profits of lands are enabled by the 24th section to apply for and make, in conformity with the provisions of the Act, the several improvements mentioned in the 9th section, as such as drainage, reclamation of land, erection of farm buildings, planting, etc. 14. Cutting Timmer where an estate was devised to A and the heirs upon trust to settle on B for life, subject to impeachment of waste, remainder man to C for life without impeachment of waste, remainder man to C, first and other sons in tail, and before any settlement was executed, the the trustees with the concurrence of B and C cut down the timber which allowed symptoms of decay. Sir L. Shadwell said he considered the timber to have been cut by the authority of the trustee who has superintending control over the estate, and it was not a wrongful act, and that the effect must have been the same as if been done with the sanction of the court. In the latter case, the court seemed to think that the tenant for life, impeachable for waste, would not be chargeable with interest during his own life, as to such timber felled by him as the court have been ordered to be cut, but that one onus would be on the tenant for life to make out such was the case. 15. Settled Land Act. Now, by the Settled Land Act of 1882, Section 35, a tenant for life impeachable for waste may, and the consent of the trustees for the settlement or an order of the court, cut and sell timber ripe and fit for cutting, but for three-fourths parts of the net proceeds of the sale are to be set aside as capital money arising under the Act. 16. Management of land and receipt and application of income during minority. In the case of the instruments, containing into operation that the 30, after the 31st of December, 1881, under which an infant, not being a married woman, is beneficially entitled to the possession or receipt of the rents and profits for the land or her rediments, corporeal or incorporeal, large powers of management during the minority of the infant have, unless the contrary intention is expressed in the instrument, been provided by the Conveyancing and Law of Property Act, 1881, Section 42 of that Enact is this. One, if as long as any person who would but for this section be beneficially entitled to the possession of any land is an infant and being a woman is also unmarried, 
The trustee is appointed for the purpose of the settlement, if any, or if there is none so appointed, then persons, if any, who are the same being under the settlement trustees with the power of sale and the settlement, uh, the settled land, or part thereof, or with power of consent to approval of the exercise of such power of a sale, or if there are none, then any person appointed as trustee for the purpose of the court on the application of a guardian or next friend of the infant may enter into a continuing possession of the land, and in ever such case the subsequent provisions of the, sub of the section shall apply. Two, the trustee shall manage or superintend the management of the land with full power to fell or cut underwood from time to time in the usual course of sale or for repairs or otherwise to erect, pull down, repair or repair houses and other buildings and erections and to continue the working of mines, minerals and quarries which have usually been worked and to drain or otherwise improve the land or any part thereof and to ensure against loss by fire and to make allowances to and arrangements with tenants and others to determine tenancy and to accept surrenders of leases and tenancies and generally to deal with the land in a proper and due course of management. But so that the infant is impeachable for waste, the trust <coughs> excuse me, the trustees shall not commit waste and shall cut timber on the same terms only to the subject to the same restrictions and on subject which the infant could, if at full age, cut the same. Three, the trustees may from time to time, out of the income of the land, including the produce of the sale of timber and underwood, pay the expenses incurred in the management or in the exercise of any power conferred by this section or otherwise in relation to the land and all outgoings not payable by any tenant or other persons and shall keep down any a new annual sum and the interest of any principal sum charged on the land. Or the trustee may apply at discretion any income which, in exercise of such discretion, they deem proper according to the infant's age for his or her maintenance, education, or benefit, or pay thereout any money to the infant's parent or guardian to be applied to the same purposes. By the trustee shall lay out the res residue of the income and the land and investment on securities on which they by the settlement, if any, or by law, authorize to invest trust money with power to to vary instruments and shall accumulate the income of investments so made in the way of compound interest and from time to time similarly invest such income in the resulting income of investments and shall stand possessed of the accumulated fund arising from the income of the land and from investments of income on the trust following, namely, I, if the infant attains the age of 21 years, then in trust for the infant, I, I, and the infant is a woman or marries while an infant, then in trust for her a separate use independently of her husband, so that her receipt after she marries and though still an infant shall be good discharge. But I, 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 if the infant dies while an infant and being a woman without having been married, then where the infant was under the settlement tenant for life or by purchase tenant and tail or tenant male or tenant female on trust, if any, declared of the accumulated funds by the settlement but there is no such trust are declared, or the infant has taken the land from which an accumulated fund is derived by descent and not by purchase, or the infant is tenant for an estate in fee simple, absolute, or determinable, then in trust for the infant's personal representatives as part of the infant's personal estate, but the accumulations or any part thereof may at any time be applied as if the same were income arising in then current year. Six, where infant's estate or interest is an undivided share of land, the powers of this section relative to the land may be exercised jointly with persons entitled to possession of or having power to act in relation to the other undivided shares, share or shares. 17. Trustees are authorized to oppose the bill in Parliament prejudicial to city key trusts. Conservators of public works and similar quasi-trustees are authorized to apply the funds under control in opposing a bill in Parliament, the effect of which will, if, if passed, would be injurious to the in interest confide to them. Every trustee, said Lord Cunningham, is entitled to be allowed the reasonable and proper expenses incurred in protecting the property committed to his care. But if they have a right to protect the property from immediate and direct injury, they must have the same rights where the injury threatened is indirect, 
but probable. 18, applications to Parliament. On the other hand, quasi-trustees, such as those before referred to, are not entitled to apply the funds of an existing undertaking in or towards the expense of obtaining other than or larger parliamentary powers. 19, as to insurance. A trustee would, it is conceived under special circumstances, in a due course of management, be justified in insuring the property, but where there is a tenant for life, he could not be advised to do so out of the income without the tenant for life's consent. But if an annuity and a policy for life of the city keep B be made to the subject of the settlement, it be implied that the trustee is to pay the premiums out of the income. A mortgagee is not regarded as trustee, and if the absence of a stipulation on the subject, he affects an insurance, it is his own account, and he cannot claim to be entitled to the premiums under just allowances. It is the same as the lease or, or leasee insured in the case of the other would have no claim to the benefit of the policy. 20. Direction by testator to carry on trade. In a recent case in Ireland, it has been held that the general bequeathed in a will of a trader to trustees upon trust to permit his wife to carry on his business so long as he should remain in a widow was equivalent to the direction to the trustee to carry it on themselves with the property employed by the testator himself in the trade, and that the assets to the extent of such property were liable to pay for goods supplied to the testator's will for the trade carried on by her, and where a will contained a direction that the testator's business was to be carried on for a specific time without any actual disposition of the property beyond the direction of the payment by the executors of certain legacies, the executors were held to be entitled, so long as the business were carried on for the purpose of the will, to be free use and occupation of the business premise and the fixed plant and machinery without paying any rent for the same. Where a testator gave all his real and personal estate to trustees upon trust for sale and conveyance, conversion and empowered them to carry on his business and employ therein all the capital invested therein at his death and to increase or abridge the business and his capital therein an equitable mortgage by the trustees of the testator's real estate to raise monies which are applied for the purpose of the business was held to be within their powers. 21. Breaking up the testator's establishment. An executor is allowed a reasonable time for breaking up the testator's establishment in the period of two months in one case was considered not to be excessive. Executors, as general rule, do not pay legacies until the expiration of one year from the testator's death, but this is the rule of convenience, and therefore, if the assets be clearly sufficient for payment of debts and legacies, there is nothing to prevent the ex executors from discharging the legacies before the expiration of the year. 22. Appropriation an executor may appropriate a legacy without the necessity of a suit where the appropriation is such that a court itself would have directed. 23. Maintenance. A trustee may expend sums of money for the protection of the safety or support of the city key trust who is incapable of taking care of himself, but the more prudent course is to apply to the court. 24. Out of interest. If a legacy be left to an infant, the court, upon application, would, from the inability of the parent to support his child, order maintenance out of the interest. The trustee should make advances for the purpose without suit and would be allowed them in this, in this account. In the case of Andrew versus Partington, Lord Thurlow refused to indemnify the trustee, but the authority of that decision has been repeatedly denied and may be considered as overruled. And the maintenance of each year need not be confined to the interest of that year, but that the trustee will be allowed in his accounts to set off the gross amount of the maintenance against the gross amount of the interest. Recent Act, now by the 43rd section of the Conveyancing Law and Property Act, 1881, trustees under instruments coming into operation either before or after the commencement of the Act, holding property for an infant either for life or for greater interest, and whether absolutely or contingently on his attaining 21, or an occurrence of any event before the age attaining that age, are expressly authorized to apply the income of that property or any part thereof or for, or for or towards maintenance, education, or benefit of the infant, or to pay to the infant's parent or guardian for that purpose, and this whether 
there be any other fund applicable to the same purpose or any person bound by law to provide for the infant's maintenance or education or not. And the trustees are to accumulate the residue of the income in a way of compound interest for the benefit of the person who ultimately becomes entitled to the property from which the accumulations arise with power at any time to supply such accumulations as income for the current year. Under this section, the trustees have discretionary power to apply past accumulations of income and payment of past maintenance. 25. This section applies only if it is so far as the contrary intention and not expressed in the instrument under which the interest of the infant arises and is to have effects subject to the terms of the instrument, but in the direct discretion direction of the trustees to accumulate the income for the shares of, of children who are entitled contingently on their attaining 21 or being daughters attaining the age of or marrying and may pay the same to them as when their presumption shares presumptive shares becomes payable is not the expression of such a contrary intention. 26. Income of gift absolute in form but liable to be defeated. In corresponding section in Lord Cransworth Act, the wording which was very similar was held not to apply to the case of a gift's absolute in first instance, but liable to be defeated in the event of a legatee not attaining 21. In such a case, the accumulations of income were held to belong to the infant's estate, notwithstanding his death under age. It may be doubted whether the case was not intended to be covered by the enactment, but it does not fall within the strict letter of it, and no distinction can be drawn with respect between the language of the corresponding sections in the Lord Cransworth Act and the recent Act. 27. Income of Contingent Gift Where the infant was entitled contingently on the attaining 21 or on some event before his attaining that age to a legacy carrying interest in the meantime, the power of maintenance in the Lord Cransworth Act applied, as does also the power under the recent Act but where the further of contingency is involved in the gift, and in addition to the attaining 21, the contingency of surviving a particular person, the case does not come within the session of either of the acts, and neither the trustee nor the court can apply the income or maintenance, and there is no obligation to accumulate. 28. Another question which arises under this section is whether an infant is entitled to maintenance out of the income property to which he is entitled contingently on attaining 21, where independently of this, this section, the infant could never be entitled to the income. As for the instance in the case of pecuniary legacy given to a person not the parent or local parentis to an infant contingently on his attaining 21, this question is not free from difficulty having regard to the state of the law prior to the recent enactment and to the uh, language of the section. For Lord Cransworth's Act, where the infant was contingently entitled to property, the trustees were empowered to apply towards the maintenance and education of the infant, the whole or any part of the income which was such infant might be entitled in respect to such property. And it was held in re George that the power did not extend to the case of a contingent pecuniary legacy not carrying interest until the time of payment. In this state of the law, the Conveyancing and Law of Property Act, 1881, was passed and Section 43 omitted the words, quote, to which such infant might be entitled to respect of such property, unquote, but notwithstanding the variance, variation in the language of the late act, it has been held at the Court of Appealing, affirming J.K., or K.J., that the section does not apply to the case of a pecuniary legacy given to an infant contingently upon attaining 21, followed by a residuary gift. In L.J. Cottington's opinion, there was such a case, no property held in trust for an infant within the meaning of the section until the time arises for serving the legacy from the residue, that is, until the infant attains 21, while L.J. Fry's opinion, the gift of the residue was, which independently from the section carries the income accruing during the minority, of, minority to the residuary legatee is sufficient expression of the contrary expression within subsection 3, to take the case out of the act. 29, where property held is for an infant for life. The section of the late act gives rise to this further difficulty. The power applies to the case 
of property held in trust for an infant for life, but the surplus accumulations are to be held for the benefit of the person who ultimately becomes entitled to the property from which the same arises. It is difficult to construe the word property in different senses as the same section to attach any other meaning to these words than the accumulations are to be added to and go to the corpus of the property and it is conceived that the result of the clause, although its effect is to de deprive an infant who has an absolute life interest of income accrued during his minority and not required for his maintenance. The difficulty no doubt arose from the language of Lord Cranbury's Act, which did not apply to a life interest, being copied without the necessary modification and until the point had been denied or decided it was prudent in any instrument giving a life interest to an infant to insert the maintenance clause and exclude the operation of the section. 30 conflicting powers under the recent act. It has been observed that the case, cases may easily arise in which the trustees would be in a position to exercise either the power of section 42 or those of section 43 of the late act, as for instance, if under an instrument coming into operation since the 31st of December, 1881, real estate were vested in them in trust for the infant for life, and the trustee had power of sale or of consenting to the exercise of a power of sale, is the accumulations of income would or might go to different channels according as the trustees were acting under the one section of the other, they had been placed in a position of difficulty. It is conceived that if it were requisite for the trustees to exercise any of the special powers of Section 42, they would be treated as having entered into possession under that section and that the accumulations of income would go accordingly, or that in a simple case where the trustees merely received the income as legal owners and had no occasion to exercise any of the powers of Section 42, the accumulations would go directly as go by directed by Section 43. It would, however, be prudent in framing any instrument under which the difficulty could arise to provide for the disposition of the accumulations. 31. Out of principle, where the amount of the legacy is considerable as 100 pounds, the court would, in the absence of other means, direct maintenance of the child out of the principle itself. The executor, therefore, who, under similar circumstances, but without the authority of the court, breaks in upon the capital, would not be liable on the city keys trust coming of age to account for the expenditure, but where payments of this kind are not strictly authorized, are made by executors or trustees, and a proprietor of them is questioned in suit, and there is deficiency of assets and the cost of the suit will have priority over the allowance to the executor or trustee. Where the legacy is not more than 300 pounds, Sir W. Grant determined that the trustee had exceeded his duty and said his impression was that the rule had never to permit trustees their own authority to break in upon the capital, but the case of Barlow versus Grant which is clearly to the contrary, must have escaped his honor's recollection. The general rule is, however, not to break into capital for maintenance, and where the legacy is considerable as 1,000 pounds or the like, as the court itself would most probably not order the application of part of the principle, the trustees would not be safe in ex exceeding his own authority to the amount of the interest. 32. Maintenance where father alive where the father of an infant is alive, trustees should, in granting maintenance, bear in mind that the court never allows the father maintenance out of his children's property without the previous inqu inquiry as to his ability to maintain them himself. The term ability, however, is relative to the position of the father and children, and the maintenance has been allowed to the father who had 6,000 pounds a year. In an express declaration of an instrument of trust, or in a previous contract, as in the case of a marriage settlement, to which the father is, an, is a party, may confer on the father the right to have uh, maintenance for his children out of the settled, settlement funds. But the decision in respect has have gone as far as to be justified upon principle. For what, where there was a power of a maintenance to the usual form in the discretion of the trustee, and the trustees, without exercising any discretion in the manner, paid the whole income to the father of the infant, it was held that the father's estate must account for the income received by him. Past maintenance. Where the father had borrowed money and enabled him to keep his children 
infant children at school and was unable to repay the debt, the court allowed him to recoup the amount so barred as an allowance for past maintenance. 33. After death of father. It was formerly much doubted whether after the death of the father maintenance could be granted to the mother so long as she continued a widow without an inquiry as to her ability, but it was ruled that where she had married again, there should be no inquiry as her, to her ability, the second husband being, it is said, under no liability to maintain the wife's children. It has been since settled that no inquiry as to the mother's ability will be directed even during her widowhood, and as the widow is undoubtedly liable to law to maintain her children, and the direction of the inquiry cannot be regarded as depending upon the legal liability. It would seem to follow that the enactment rendering a husband liable to maintain his wife's children by a former marriage ought not to make, as believed is not in a fact made, any alteration to practice of the court granting maintenance where the mother has married again without an inquiry as to ability. Number 34, where accumulation is directed, where a testator's life or property and value of 10,000 pounds a year to be accumulated for 21 years and directed that the accumulation should be laid out in purchased lands, purchase of lands which after the expiration of 21 years to be held for A, for life, and after his death of his sons in strict settlement and A's income was insufficient to enable him to bring up and educate his infant son in a manner suitable to their prospective position in life. B.C. Mallon's off allowed him £2,700 a year out of the income of the property, with liberty to apply for an increased allowances if necessary when the children grew older. But in a subsequent case in Ireland where the circumstances were similar, the court refused to follow this decision of B.C. Mallon's and held that, held that where there is an imperative trust to accumulate is the duty of the court to carry out the testator's intention and that the court has no direction to allow maintenance out of the income, and the Irish decision seems to be in accordance with sound principle. Thirty-five, interest of third parties protected. Where an accumulation has been directed by the testator and the court allows maintenance out of the accumulations, the order should be farmed or framed as to protect the interests of the third per parties by directing the interest of the infants in any legacy or share in a residue to be held as security for recouping any dominion in the accumulation. Where an infant was entitled contingently on her attaining 21 or marrying to a large proprietary, to a large property, the court sanctioned a scheme to provide for her past future maintenance by effecting a policy of assurance payable on death before either attaining 21 or marrying under it, that age, and mortgaging the policy and charging the infant's contingent interest to secure the necessary advances and compound interest, but it was expressly provided that the interest of any person other than the infant was not to be affected. 36. Advancement out of capital. A part of the capital to be sunk by trustee without this direction of the court for the advancement of the child were the same sums of expended for maintenance should not be, have been allowed. 37. Advancement where there is limit, limitation over. The trustee cannot apply part of the principal towards the advancement of the child where the legacy is subject to limitations over in favor of a stranger, for in such a case the court itself could not make an order to that effect. Thus in Lee versus Brown where the testrix had given 100 pounds to trustees upon trust to apply the pro produce to the maintenance and education of AB, and then he should attain 21 to transfer to him the capital. But in case he died under that age, the text strikes, gave the legacy to his brother and sister equally. Lord Alvary said, it certainly was not competent under the trust to the executor nor could it be, if he had applied, have obtained permission of, from this court to advance any part of the capital of the legacy in putting the child out into the world, if it had been such a case that the court would have authorized the act that was done, 
I desired to be understood that it would be considered to be as properly done, for the principle is now established that if an executor does without application what the court would have approved, he shall not be called to account and forced to undo that merely because of which done without application. But where an infant was entitled on contingency that at a certain time which but which not arrived there was the power of advancement, the trustee took upon himself the risk against the person entitled if the contingency did not happen and applied part of the capital for the advancement of the infant. It was allowed in this account as between him and the infant who was in the event became entitled. <clears throat> where there was cross limitations amongst the children and where the legacies have been given to children payable at 21 or on marriage with limitation over the death of any child before attaining 21 or marriage not in favor of a stranger but for the benefit of such of the children as should attain 21 after uh, 21 or marry the trustee who had paid the premium on the apprenticeship of a child who died under 21 was allowed it by the court the case turned upon the same principle as where the legacy is given to a class or all all or some of which must be taken the fun absolutely when as it was given equal chance of survivorship, the individuals of the class will be ordered maintenance even before their shares in the fun have become actually vested. This power is exercised by the court but cannot be exercised by the trustees without authority of the court, nor can the court itself make such an order in summary way without the institution of a suit. And that brings us to page 797, and we'll stop at number 39, pick up there next time, where consent of bankrupt tenant for life required, on page 797. So with that, why don't we open up for questions. Questions, anybody? Heat up. Hello, Matt. Hi. Sorry about that. Okay. You uh, ready to open up for questions? Yeah, yeah. All right, we got our first caller. Blonded by the light, how are you? You have been unmuted. I, I'm doing good. Welcome. <laughs> I was talking, but I was muted, so you didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Which some might think that's a really good thing. Um, hey, Christian, how are you doing tonight? Okay. I just exercised my voice. <laughs> oh, um, okay. I'll try to take a little bit of a load off. Um, I, You know, a lot of people are really interested in what's going on with, with these cases that I'm doing, and... Um, so I wanted to give you the the latest update on the newest hypothetical one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I had uh, checked the the online clerk's uh, sequence of, you know, all the events in the case, and I saw that it looked like it was still, you know, a go today. So I uh, went over to the courthouse, loaded up the meter with a bunch of quarters, and went in and, uh, went through the screening, and then I got to the bailiff, and the bailiff said, uh, um, oh, your your case has been canceled today. I said, really? And he couldn't tell me, you know, who canceled it or what. So when I got home, I called the foreclosure case management o manager's office, and they told me that the, the opposing counsel had, uh, at the last second, had, uh, you know, closed it down, you know, canceled it. And I asked why did they give a reason, and um, apparently they needed to put in a new affidavit. So this is this is really interesting to me for 
for a bunch of different reasons, but um, a com- the complaint and the affidavit, that's what that's what constitutes a lawsuit, right? I mean, people do a complaint and an affidavit, and they go pay their money, and they file a lawsuit. Yeah, because the affidavit is a sworn uh, right. statement of a party uh, making the accusation for the claim. Right, right, right. So, um, so I have one case where um, the every, apparently everything's fine in the case, but they want to go back and, and amend the original complaint. And then I have this one uh, today where they want to go back and put in an, uh, a new affidavit. So I guess what my first question would be: Did They is, put it in the complaint. I'm sorry. Uh, when they're doing the redoing the affidavit, did they put in an amended complaint? They put in a motion to amend their complaint. Okay. On the um, on the the one um, oh Lord. Uh, what were the reasons for amending the complaint? Oh, they haven't. I mean, I haven't gotten that far yet. I don't. I don't have any idea that I haven't got, received anything. Um, so I'm really curious about that one. And then the one today, they want to put in a new um, affidavit. So um, because the complaint and the affidavit is essential to start any any lawsuit, um, my question would be. I mean, I don't see how they can go back and and amend their the one of the two essential elements that they have to have to even file a case against somebody. Well, you know, you I can feel like with the state that you're in and, and find out whether or not they're allowed to have one amendment by right, but uh, you can still object to an amendment, uh, put in a motion for in opposition and state the reasons why and the grounds. Mm-hmm. Well, for for example... Um, Unopposed, well, if you don't oppose it, then it will it will be uh, standing as uh, as good then. Right. Um, yeah, I'm well, I would have put a, a motion in opposition and and state the reason why it shouldn't be allowed. Right. Well, for example, well, I'm I'm here in Florida too. Um, so, for example, if like in um, okay, just say foreclosures, for example, you know they. If it's found that an assignment was done after the case was filed, it's something that is not correctable. They can't fix it. They have to dismiss the case and refile a new case because at that time that they filed the case, they did not have standing. They were not the real party in interest. Right. Okay. There's case support that, and that, that should be a motion to dismiss, and that should be granted. Right. With a with – a, um, uh, with an assignment that's done after the fact. Yeah, but, the assignment um, had to have standing, had to be completed, and had to be attached to the uh, original uh, pleadings, uh-huh. as the filing, in order for them to be the real party in interest in order to bring a suit. If it had been transferred to them after, sometime after the filing, then at the time of filing they didn't they didn't have standing. They had no way to bring the suit, and that should be motion to dismiss. That's what I would do. If uh, you're talking about um, an assignment done after the fact, right? Yeah, after the filing date of the original complaint. Right. Now, um, I believe in Florida. I could be wrong, but um, I believe they can redo an answer if the other, if the opposing side hasn't answered yet. Um, and if they wanted to, uh, I could be wrong. I'm not really, really big on. Uh, I don't think anywhere that if a party does not have standing at the filing of the complaint, you don't have the ability to bring forth a complaint. Right, right. I mean, now, now um, that was just an example I threw out about the uh, about you're, the assignment. You're, uh, if if you don't have the right to foreclose that's transferred to you or in some other way, then you don't have the right to bring a complaint. You got a frivolous complaint. Right. Well, the the assignment um, thing I just I just threw out there as an example, um, but he, he, here's my question. Okay, because the complaint and the affidavit make up the um, the so-called standing or cause of action or whatever, right? I just I'm having a really hard time trying to 
here's what gives it. It's not just that. It's uh, I forget what rule it is in Florida. I think it's like eleven. 1170, or is it 12? 12, 12, I have to look. Uh, 1240? 1230, like that. Uh, anyway, it says that all that you need to make support your claim needs to be filed all together at the same time. And everything should be attached to your original pleading. That gives you the right to state your claim, to foreclose, or whatever the action is. Everything must be there at the original filing. If it's not, it's incomplete and shouldn't be l- allowed to be added later on. Right. Well, for example... Um, so it's not just an affidavit. If there's other, like an assignment or uh, a chain of trails for assignment into a trust, all the documentation must be included with an unbroken uh, connection Mm-hmm. Which shows that you have the, you're the real party in interest to have standing to foreclose or to make a claim. Oh yeah, and there's 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 none of that stuff in there. I mean the the business records are supposed well, to be attached. Well, that's how you holes all through it. Yeah, I mean the the business records are supposed to be attached to the affidavit, and there's nothing attached to the affidavit. The affidavit is um uh it's unverified. It's uh um oh what's the word? I'm really tired right now. Unverified on something. Authenticated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. It's not authenticated. Um, you know, it's just somebody wrote something on a piece of paper, and it's not, uh, you know, someone who would have no idea of a completely different networks, you know, uh, way they do their their business and handle their books. You know, it's not the custodian. Okay. They, what they do is they put just enough in there that gives them enough of a presumption to take you down because they don't want to do any more work than necessary. And here they did everything illegal because they didn't do it according to the law. And you could beat them up and stomp all over them with that. Mm-hmm. But most people don't know how. And most people don't know that they don't know that they're, they did something wrong. Right, right. I mean, I, I can't tell you. Some people are just cowed when they get a letter from an attorney firm. They're just like, "Oh, I got, I got something from an attorney." You know, like it's from from God or something. It's just, you know, can't the question God. Greater portion can't... of mortgage foreclosure seizures and sales come from people who do nothing. Right. And they don't have to do anything because these people, all they got to do is. Look at them, and they run the other way. Exactly. Exactly. They give up their properties voluntarily by doing nothing. Right. Right. Silence is acquiescence. Um. So, okay. So I have one 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 foreclosure case where they want to amend. They want to amend the complaint. I have another one where they want to. Um, put in a new affidavit and uh, you know look that those are just two bare essentials that are required and you know it hey if if it's um technically they're supposed to attach that at the beginning and unless there is some reason for an amendment that is based on facts discovered but they should have all the facts and ducks lined up in a row to begin with i mean if the first affidavit is invalid you know, the second one should entirely be in question as well. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? That just makes it just follows. Um, if, Why are they if, making another new affidavit? Did they make a new assignment from somebody else or something? Um, oh, I what don't, changed? I well, um, uh, bill and equity is what changed, I guess. <laughs> That's the only thing that that was um, done recently. So, but another thing that really surprises me. Christian is, you know, it, it surprised me that I get down there, and they were doing a telephonic appearance, and uh, from Tampa. So, um, but it really surprised me that they didn't still attempt to try to go through with it. They had the court date, they had the time, everything was set, you know, and at the, the last second, they canceled it. It just shocked me that they still wouldn't just try to do it, just try to get 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 over, you know. So did they uh, 
Did they get the notice that you had done discovery, uh, filed discovery in there? I had done that right before I went upstairs. Do you think that they knew that? Um, it's they. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Uh, well, um, kind of too close together, but anyway, I was just wondering. Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. It does seem <clears throat> extraordinarily coincidental. Very much. Um, but but here's here's what I wanted to ask you. Okay, I know. Okay, like the example I gave about the assignment. If they don't, if it's not assigned to them when they file, uh, you know, if it's after, then they they have no standing. They have to, you know, throw out the case and start anew. And I I realize that there's a difference between um, an assignment done after the fact and a um, complaint with an affidavit. Okay, because those can be changed up. Uh, I guess. Um, so, but if they want to change what they brought, you know, some change one of the main things that you have to bring forth in a case to even file. I mean, that seems to me like it. That would um, that would end it. Also, I, I could be totally wrong, but well, usually what they do is they they file a copy of the the note which is in blank then later on they bring in this assignment uh that's been endorsed differently than what the original ones that was attached which which is a no no really right now, it's not in blank any longer now it's got the name of the party who was bringing suit say or somebody else maybe mhm well it's a it's a really strange hypothetical case because um uh, the note in question is endorsed in blank from from the beginning. It's in blank. And, um, oh, my gosh, I can't remember what I was just going to say. I get so ditzy when I'm tired. Wow. Oh, okay. First off, um, uh, there was a... Count two in in this case, foreclosure case, was um, a count to reestablish the note. And then then all of a sudden, three months later, they find the note, right? <laughs> um, but it was amazing because they, they do an affidavit that they lost the note, but they uh, – they don't know when they lost it, but they knew they had it, but they couldn't say when they had it and when they lost it. It's like, oh, my, you know. This is that is why just, they want to complain, because now they found the note? Um, oh, they found the note earlier, like months ago. This is this is something absolutely new, and I'm sure it doesn't. Someone said, <clears throat> someone said, well, do you think it's an affidavit for attorney's fees? <laughs> I said, I don't think it would be. <laughs> No, I don't think so. There's something seriously wrong, you know. But it was really kind of funny because um, there were some institutions out there, you know, that that stopped going forward to make sure they wanted to make sure that all their their affidavits were good. And then apparently they felt they were, and now apparently they're not. So. <laughs> Well, an affidavit is the lowest form of evidence. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's uh, really amazing. You were you were talking earlier about how um, an an individual or uh, living people are part of a trust, right? Yeah, it's a relationship between living people. So. That's what a trust is. A trust is not a relationship between dead people. Okay, well... Um, Fictions. Okay, but in one of these hypothetical cases... The setting of oh. trust is not a fiction. Okay, so uh, what if... Um, are you saying that... A fiction cannot be a trustee for a trust? 
Well, only as a straw man because the there has to be a live person behind that straw man to be the trustee. Okay, so it That's can't be a real live person, a real live party. Okay, so live. when they just when they just put out uh, you know some institution's name as the trustee, you know it, it has there it's. Um, now, anytime you got a, a fiction involved, you got a statutory trust. Now that puts it on the at law side, and that is not a private trust. Mm-hmm. Everybody thinks trust when somebody mentioned trust that all these trusts are the same thing. They're not. A statutory trust is different from a private trust, enforceable in equity. So let me let me ask you this. Okay, so just say uh, a big food chain store um, tried to come against me as a trustee for a pool. Okay, so if it's a a fiction, then it has to be a statutory trust. Statutory trust, right. But um, it's really kind of confusing because... A statutory trust is different, different from a private trust. Right. Okay. So, I mean, it can't be the this uh, huge fiction that is that is a trustee. I mean, there has to be a someone that is a trustee. It, it just seems to me it just can't be like I don't want to say anything specific. I'm trying really hard. On the side, they're talking about the subject matter being the res. No, on the equity side, the subject matter is really impersonum. It's about a real live person, a relationship between a real live person. Okay. And that people are getting all this stuff confused. And really, it's nothing different than what it's been in the past, which is all debtor-creditor with a new face mask. And that face mask is, now we're talking about trust. But it's still the same stinking thing that these gurus are teaching. Debtor-creditor, not private trust. You know what? I've had so many people try to put that ex- executor letter on me, and I tell them, you know, I'm going to cancel it because uh, don't even waste your time, and um, you know, and I, I don't want my time wasted. It's just another red herring for people to go off on. That's a dead end. It's, it doesn't even make any sense. Some people they don't are passing this stuff around, saying, "Hey, but this is the this is the best thing," you know, and it's right. not the same thing with a different face mask on it. Exactly. It's like, you know, wake up and smell the face mask, you know. <laughs> and I'm I'm really, you know, down on people who have been in the MTT group for any length of time and don't know the difference. Right. Right. I mean, it's just it's, people, you know, I would think, just out of this, this paragraph that I read opening, it's talking about this, this legal fiction. It says a trust. And you think about it. If you were with us when we started the Lewin book on the first or second page where it defined what a trust was, it talked about it's a relationship between live entities, mm-hmm. not dead fictions. Then it can't be a legal fiction being a trust. Because it violates thousands of years of trust precedents. Well, you know what? I was there when you when you started that, but then I've absorbed so much information that sometimes it takes hearing it a second time or a third time, sometimes even a tenth time, for it to really kick in. And that that just totally kicked in with me today on the call. I mean, that just I totally got that. And it's like all these puzzle pieces just keep, you know, connecting up. You know, I mean, it's it's fantastic. I will never, ever not remember that ever again, you know. I mean, I'll always, that will be in the forefront of my mind. So, um, yeah, but, but trust me, trust me on the, on the, um, that motion to amend the complaint foreclosure and the um the one for uh um wanting to redo the affidavit i'm going to be all over that like a cheap suit 
<laughs> all over that. I am going to be holding feet to the fire. I'm the I I'm like the the guinea pig. <laughs> So I have to be a really good guinea pig, <laughs> yeah. Really stay consistent and just, you know, have dates. You know, when their time's up, when I do, you know, the uh, motion to compel, when I do a show cause, you know, all that stuff. You know, I'm going to be right I'll on top of Get them on the, uh, a full gamut of discovery, which would be production of documents, admissions and interrogatories, and... You're, you really don't have to do depositions, although you could. But just with those three, if they fall down on that, then then I go in for the motion to compel. Mm-hmm. And usually if it's got people that don't know what they're doing and they need time to learn more stuff, then you could use each of those things to, like, do them sequentially and, and spread out the time that right. gives them time to learn. Otherwise... Right. I really would have done it all together all at once because that way you, after 30 days and they fall down off both on production, admissions, and interrogatories, then you can hammer them with the motion to compel, get the order signed out of the court, and when they don't uh, come up with the documents, then you go for the dismissal. That's interesting. Depend- yeah, so people have a choice. <laughs> you know, don't like, do like- The people who know how what they're doing which is you can have them dismissed in 60 days mm-hmm. or you can take and spread it out for people who don't know what they're doing because they need more time to learn. They don't have court experience. That's beautiful. That's and beautiful. from that, stretch it out to a year and a half, 18 months. Well, you know, they're going to they're gonna be complaining, um, you know, fighting tooth and nail about – you know, the title pages and assignment and all that, you know, and a statement of account. I mean, they're going to be fighting like crazy not to give it. You know, I mean, they would prolong it themselves. But once you've done discovery, and once you've asked for discovery, they don't produce the discovery, and that that seals the, the coffin. Mm-hmm. Well, that's... You know, if somebody, if some, if um, a, if I injure someone, if I damage property, or you know, commit fraud or whatnot, if I, if I injure someone or damage property, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely liable. I am definitely liable. You know, I had a, um, a careless driving incident where I literally choked to death in my car while my car was going about 40 miles an hour and I was going down a downgrade about like a 30 degree downgrade so the car was accelerating faster and faster and I'm dead (laughs) I'm I'm dead and um, the only thing that saved me was about a mile down the road uh, there was a woman that uh, just sat there waiting to take a left and she could have went several times and for some reason, she bent down to pick something up, and my car slammed into her. And that's the only thing that saved me was it was either hitting, it was either um, the the actual impact of the car, my car hitting her car, and or the airbags deploying that actually did like a Heimlich maneuver by proxy and got me breathing again. I don't even know why I brought that up, but. Um, <laughs> I'm really, really tired. But anyway, um, you know, really, really cool things, really blessed things happen all the time. And, you know, I appreciate, really appreciate them more and more because, you know, I've always said that nobody owes me anything, you know. So when when people do kind things, you know, I never forget it, and I, I just, I've really gotten a lot of support, you know, from people in NTT, and it's just great. I, I just really, really love everybody, and really appreciate all the help and everything. Very much appreciated. I, I've been saying tons of prayers for you and Lisa, you know, to get better. And you sound pretty good tonight, Christian. I don't hear you coughing. 
Yeah, I had to do a little yelling there. <laughs> Get the lungs cleared out. Oh, good. Good. But, um, yeah, I'll I'll keep everybody updated. And, you know, I'm on the calls every single night. And, you know, if I see someone going off on a executor letter path or something, you know, I'll, I'll try to steer them right back on well, the... It makes me angry because... The people who don't know that they don't know are sucking this stuff up and falling into this trap, which is the same crap that we've been trying to get out of, this D.C. realm. Well, you know what? I, I, I want to tell you something. Um, I I had like an epiphany the other, the other day, and it was like, um, you know, I totally, I totally um, comprehend you know, the the dog going back to its vomit over and over and over again. It grosses me out every time I think about that, but i gotta, I got to say this to you. <laughs> um, That's it in a nutshell. Yeah, so so it's like you finally get to the point where you're not going back to it over and over and over again, but what's even worse is seeing other people keep going back to it over and over again in front of you. That's even worse. And it's like you just... You just want to say, stop, don't do that. It's it's a waste of time. You're spinning your wheels. It's a red herring. It's a dead end, you know. And But it's such a such a habit. And I think a lot of these people feel like the devil they know is safer than the, than the one they don't know. But um, the one that they do know is a devil, and they know it's a devil. So, my, you know, and the odds of... Getting anywhere on the outlaw side is virtually nil. So why well, the young ones are, you know, at a disadvantage because they don't know how to look at, see what, discern what they're looking at, and they right. think sounds great. Let's go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. No, you don't. You need to be checking out the facts. And really, you look at these articles. There are no facts in any of these articles. Mm-hmm. All they are is just the same with what everybody else is used to, a conclusory pleading of you making just nothing but statements of NOIs and not supporting it with any SOIs. There is nothing in this that backs any of it up, according to this article I'm looking at right now. There's nothing in here. All it is is a bunch of hearsay upon hearsay. Well, it's Based like... on the same stuff that we've been listening to for years from these gurus from the D.C. realm. Mhm. Well, one thing you've pounded into my head was, you know, the example about the the NOI. You broke my arm. Well, you need the you need the SOI as well, the X-ray of the broken arm. You know, it's and you know, if people would just stop. I mean, I had to force myself to stop being a member of the form of the week club. I mean, I was, you know, I was, Running off on the latest. Oh wow! Well, do the do this one or that one, and this is going to get you this, and this is going to get you that. You know. And one day I just said, "What? What am I doing? This this doesn't even. You know, this is ridiculous, and it doesn't work. And they're not going to recognize you. It's as ridiculous as trying well, to step into a cartoon. All down on this first premise for the fact that it doesn't contain any facts that you can go check out. Right, right. And I tell people, I said, you know, I said, look, if you could go jump into a cartoon like Wile E. Coyote, you know, and The Road Runner, and you're in in this cartoon and you're waving your arms, are they even going to notice you're there? No, they're not going to recognize you. And I, you know, that's like the at law side. It's a waste of time. And I just wish, uh, wish people would just really focus on NTT and just. Get rid of all that other extraneous stuff that's, you know, that's well, pushing I'm, off to the I'm side. That people need to back up with facts what they're claiming because people can go and check it out for themselves. But there, if there's no facts in these things, all they are is just conclusions of whatever they've read. Mm-hmm. And I'm supposed to believe that? And, and most people will just believe that. That's the problem. We're too lazy. We don't understand what basic government is in order to do basic government. Mm -hmm. Basic government is you've got to state NOIs, make claims, and then support them with SOIs, evidence, to back up your statements so that somebody else can go and check it out and see whether or not 
You're right. If you're not, you're just spreading hearsay. Well, it, you know, the SOI is nothing without the NOI. If you just, you know, and the NOI is nothing without the SOI. Got to have them both. You got to have them both. Yeah. Got to have them both. I that's mean, basic government, and that's everybody's problem. They don't know how to do basic government, so they can't discern any facts because there's no facts in there to discern anyway. Right. Well, think about it. If if I'm waving around an X ray of my broken arm, uh, nothing's going to come of it because I I haven't uh, I haven't made a claim. You know. Right. And if I just make a just make a claim and I don't have anything to back it up, I don't have anything. That's what all this secular stuff is. Right. <laughs> I know, I know. But I I think, uh, you know, people are thinking it's like, um, you know, it's like, a, you know, the trust thing. But, I mean, but when, the, when it reads that they cannot deal with this, us, until we bring in the, uh, that we admit that it, we're dead, a legal fiction, a trust. Mm-hmm. If you've got the discernment, as soon as you hear that, your ears pick up and say, no, that's not right. But unless you know that a legal fiction is not a trust, a legal fiction is a relationship between live people, then you're so easily convinced that a legal fiction is a trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Then you can do the executor letter or the whatever next new guru thing comes out. Mhm. Because it's not based on any true understanding. Right. On fact. Right. It's a mirage. It's not. There's no substance to it. It's just form. It's a. It's a wish. That doesn't come through. You know, people get tired of going back and forth, and you know, I mean, they they will they will see. After how many, you know, I mean, how many times does one need to get beat down? It's, you know what, Christian, it's almost like people have this weird kind of Stockholm Syndrome or something. You know, I mean, where they, it's almost like they, they feel sorry for their, their, their captive, their, you know, captives. Or their um, captors. It's really a sign of the times because narrow is the gate that leads to success, and but wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and few there be that find the other one. Right. Well, I have total faith and so confidence. Good. Here's the other ones look so good, it's pleasing to the eyes, and that's mm-hmm. the path that's going to go down because that looks like it's the easiest. Right. You know, but becoming, really becoming a man or really becoming a woman is not an easy thing to do. No, that's age of majority, and that's got nothing to do with age, but it's right. got to Right. I, I, I know some two-year-olds that were um, more at the age of majority than some 80-year-olds, you know. But, uh, you know, um, you know, I'll keep telling people. You know, that executive, executor letter is dead-end red herring, so some people do listen to me, <laughs> believe it or not. So, uh, but I feel like I am, I am on the right path. I'm on the, it, I'm, this is a narrow path, but it's the best path, and nothing will convince me otherwise. Um, there's just, I mean, you have all these facts, you know, all the, all the documentation, you know, the proof, you have everything. And, you know, people need to invest time in themselves because they are worth it. I wish people would feel they had more worth. You know, they just, there is no huge, right now, immediate silver bullet. You know, um, they have to, they have to take time and they have to invest in themselves. And, I feel this is one of the absolute best investments as far as time that I've ever done in my life as far as NTT goes. People need to, um, and if they if they don't have a really good understanding of it, 
then it, they need to take the responsibility and, you know, go through all these words and know exactly what they mean so they will. You know, the onus is not on you to, um, you know, it's it's you're doing something selfless and wonderful and, and kind and, you know, people need to see it as the huge, enormous gift that it is. You know, and if they don't, then um, they wouldn't appreciate it. I mean, like I do. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, sometimes NTT just, my jaw drops with the sheer power of it. It's just, it's mind-blowing. I'll just sit here sometimes, you know, I'll hear you say something or I'll read something and, and I'll just, I'll be like stunned. I'll be like, oh my gosh, thank, thank God I am not in you know, at law, like, like I used to be before, you know, and, uh, it's, it's soaring with the eagles, NTT, and, uh, just incredible, and the more people invest in themselves, the more they will see that, you know. Well, few there be that find it, that's the problem, so. Well, you're an excellent teacher, at least they've been warned. Yes. Yes. That's true. Very true. Well, I really appreciate your time. I've I've kept you on way too much longer than um I meant to and I don't want to take up your voice or the whole call. Okay. So right. but thank you so much, Christian, and everybody out there that, that helps and you know, whatever I can do to help anybody else, let me know. I'll be more okay, than happy Thanks. to help out. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you later, Christian. All right. Okay, we got somebody else there, Matt? Hello, we got somebody else lined up. Pat, you out there? You can come to sleep. Who's this, Floyd? Hello, Hello? Chris. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Chris, this is Albert from Texas. Hi, Albert. How are you doing? Okay, man. Thank you. Um, besides having a, a virus and the computer, I'm fine. But my question is this. I've been, I was reading a few books the last few days, and uh, not to offend the gents across the waters, you know, the pounds involved kind of con- gotten confused. You know, those, they're, they're talking about pounds, no shillings, just pounds. Anyways, uh, if part, yeah, let me give you a foundation. Uh, party A is an extinguisher. Okay, if Party A wanted to uh, extinguish uh, Party B's debt, can can it be done privately without, like, you know, for instance, uh, let's yeah, say done privately. In fact, that's really the only way it's going to be done, really. Well, let, let's say I want to. Pay your debt. Okay, that's my uh, objection. And 
in order to not commingle, what I, I as I as I as I uh, received uh, my thoughts on, on on what I read, could could it be done where uh, I go to you and I go, look, I I just uh, extinguished your debt, but um, I need to make a consideration with you, you know, get a consideration like ten bucks. And uh, would would that keep it inside the limitation? I'm not going into the commingling. No, if I <clears throat> if I extinguish the debt, I wouldn't need to have the the ten dollar consideration. So okay, because the ten dollars I had to dis I'd have to discharge or I mean not discharge I'd have to extinguish the ten dollars too. Yeah, right. I get you. Uh, but here, here's another thing I, I was thinking of throwing at you is that I'm going to do this for you, but I don't want you creating more debt. Well, that's the problem. They're going to go out there. If they don't know this stuff, they'll go out there and do just that, and then that's breaching the trust. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what if what, what if I, I also told you, now, now listen here. I'll do this, extinguish it. Uh, knowing knowing that there's no contracts because of no money, but I make a, 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 a deal with you that for at least six months minimum that you will not go create more debt, like get loans, those kind, not the kind where you have to go buy food and and necessary well, items. Well, that's, 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 you can't do that because that's the same thing. Oh, it is? That you leave it out altogether and you don't do any more debt or else you – there's no such thing as getting halfway out. Well, you, you can do a discharge on an individual, say, case by case or instant by instant thing, but then you're always going to be creating new debt somewhere along the line because that's the whole nature of the system. So you can't really do commerce anymore. So you've got to get out of commerce altogether, and you can't just do that half. Well, see, this, Christian, I'm going under the presumption that you don't know anything. You know, you don't know trust. You don't know nothing. But if I make a deal with you where you don't go and make more debt for just for six months, or maybe five months or three I months, I can't that deal with you because I got to go out and buy food. Right. I'm not talking about that kind of debt. All right. I'm talking about big loans. Home In other loans. words. Now, hey, I want to get a contract with you, so you go out. And I'm going to pay your all your debt off, but then you're allowed to go out and create some debt that I'm going to allow. Well, well, see, I'm not going to try and, and, and you know put cuffs on you. All right, uh, I'm just trying to extinguish somebody's debt and try and get their word that uh, for three months they're not going to go make loans, car loans, because see, they'll be free of debt or at least free of some big debt, not really free of all debt. Right. You'll, right. you'll be free just of, a, like, your home or your car, something that is burdensome, heavily burdensome. So you have this extra cash, you don't know nothing, and, of course, I would like for you to learn something. But I can't, you know, just stop and and go through what I just went through with you to learn this stuff, I couldn't do that with somebody. They'd have to do it on their own. They'd have to pick up their own feet. But that's, the point that's is, the fallacy of being able to pay somebody else's debt, though. That's the thing. You really, you really can't pay somebody else's debt because they themselves have to take care of themselves, and they themselves have to get out, and they themselves have to stop doing the debt. Well, nobody else can do it but them. You have to get a hundred people to say, I'm not going to create any debt for a year other than the little stuff, my paycheck, because they work, you know, uh, get food and stuff like that. But for one year, they don't go and use credit cards, nothing, and they, because they're free now from heavy burdens. And if they could do it for one year. Yeah, but this, it's kind of like, okay, which sin is a lesser sin? No, God well, looks at any sin as being an affront to him. Period. Right, but these guys, uh, they don't know they're sinning. can't say, okay, a little bit of sin or a little bit of debt is okay. No, none of it's okay. Right. I would say those things to that person, but you see, I couldn't control them as to... I know, 
know, I would know. really want to control somebody, but I would want to educate them in what I know so that they could do what I what I'm doing or what I've done. And that's the, totally out. The the thing is, Kristen, uh, and and you well know, everybody knows this this stuff. You have to really, you know, get it the bull by the horns. To learn right, it. right. It's not easy. No, it takes some time. I mean, we we spent twelve years in in school, and we didn't learn the right stuff. So we're gonna have to redo it and do another twelve years and learn the right stuff this time. Right. And, you know, uh, to sit down or even have a hundred people in a class, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm getting too old. I'd rather just keep on trucking and keep yeah, on. Yeah, I'm more uh, interested in teaching the people who want to learn this rather than get somebody to want to do it or learn it. That's outside my room. Yeah, your realm is a, a teacher. There's no doubt about it. I see that gift. You know, not too many people have that stamina, patience. Okay, everybody's got different gifts. You just happen to have that one, and you're good. You're what? You're good. You do that well. But uh, we don't know about this stuff. But uh, you know, I more or less get the, the the shock value on their face from when you tell them. You know, and then the, the deer in the headlights look. You know, <laughs> but you know, hey. At least they've been informed, and now they got some kind of make a decision on. Uh, if they want to pursue it, they can pursue it. If not, you know, hey, I'd much rather see somebody who wants to chuck a DC realm and wants to go NTT holy, and that's the person I'm interested in. Absolutely. And, you know, me, um, I, I don't think I uh, sit down and have class, but I could do some stuff and then point them to the people that, have that gift that are involved right now that want to do that, and that I'll, I w- would do, of course. And if they w- really wanted to learn, I would tell them, well, then tag yourself to my butt and learn, you know, as I move on and move forward and do what uh, I really want to do. But uh, as I was reading these documents, these books, uh, I came across, of course, the ones with pounds and stuff, and I I kept looking at this stuff, and I remember, uh, I think it's a motto on the Skype. It's a, uh, the motto is, you got to look it through trust eyes. Yep. Okay, well, you know what? I, uh, because we have the, uh, we, we have the power to change from Grant or Ben to grant or trustee when we need to. We're more like a chameleon, actually, you know. And and a chameleon has two eyes that are independent. So as I looked through these books and, and I pulled out this stuff, uh, I saw where trustee, I got trustee out of it with my at-law side, and I got equity out of my equity eye. Mm-hmm. And what I came across was that, um, like, for instance, for the class. Is this a class, uh, by the way, Kristen, t- tonight? You can oh, yes. A, yeah, Q&A. Okay. Um, the fact that the trustee cannot sell without the consent of a beneficiary does not destroy his power or disposition to deprive him of legal title. So mm-hmm. through the class of what I said, and they might have to go back to this call, because I'm not going to repeat it and waste your time. Um, I want them to tell me who's the trustee here, or to themselves, actually, yeah? <laughs> or to you. And another one I came across is uh, resting uh, the title on the trustee is not affected by reservation of the settler or the power to terminate the trust. Who's the trustee there? The second one, third one, I'm sorry, is trustee has no superior rights with respect to the trust property than his grantor in any circumstance that operates against the grantor 
would bar the claim of the trustee. Who's the trustee there? And then the last one. Trustee can convey any interest in the subject matter of the trust, but he must not substitute another in its place as trustee also uh, without the consent of those interested. Who are the interested and who is the trustee there? And these are questions that, um, as I, you know, read through this stuff, I looked at it and uh, I came across, of course, some answers. And uh, if you want, you know, I will tell you what I thought about it and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. And I did come across. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, one, that uh, the last one. Trustee cannot hold legal title to an estate or a fund, an absolute title vested in another. Who's the trustee? You know, what, uh, 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 when, you know, because of the subject matter that all of us got involved, of course, some had, uh, we all had our own little problems, but I'm talking about the major subject matter that we all want to do. Um, I was looking at the at law side of what I was reading and the equity part, and I did, I do have an answer that I can, you know, that I came to a conclusion. And I'll only say it if you want me to, but it was just for the class to look at these sentences if uh, they can so uh, disrutain when they listen to this call again, because uh, it really popped out and slapped me in the face. So maybe maybe it's not that important to other guys, but this one really was. Uh, this, these were really good ones as I looked at it, and. Um, just to, I guess, just give the answer. What the heck? What what I saw in the first one, the fact that trustee cannot sell without the, the beneficiary's uh, consent, and it doesn't destroy the dispute. I looked at that as the trustee as real. Beneficiary is me. Now, because we know she's part of a fiction, not you know necessarily uh, like the her uh, other side, but she is part of the fiction because she's got a, a title made up and an employee of the people. And on the second one, re resting the title on a trustee does not uh, is not affected by the reservations of the settler. Settler is me. Trustee is her. And the power to terminate the trust is in me. And it's funny, you know, you, 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 these books that you sent us to, you, you can look at them and pull these things out. I mean, I can now. Maybe the other guys were already doing it long long ago, but, hey, I arrived. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd agree with you in, in one sense. Uh, but there's a, a stipulation with that, though. Yeah. That would be on an unexpressed trust. The trustee is the United States on a misconstruement. On an express trust, that would be real then. Yeah, okay, I see it. And uh, under, yeah. under, under a non-express trust, under a misconstruement, the trustee would be the United States. Now, would you uh, would you add a little bit to that? So they're considering themselves to be the beneficiary, right? With the right to trade. But see, this is not an express trust, although it's it's not expressed in the public. It still is a trust in the private. But since it's not expressed, the public doesn't recognize it, and therefore it's not a trust. And that's what gives them the beneficial right to take as the United States. Because it's really not expressed trust. There, there is no trust until you create it and express it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's in the that's in the public. Although it exists in the private. 
because no party in the trust needs to know a trust was formed. There can be a trust in the private, but the public doesn't know about it, and it's not expressed in the public. You know, it, it's exactly, you know, of course I agree with you. I mean, that's exactly what I've learned. And the part about the the um, trustee cannot convey any interest. Reels cannot touch that beneficial interest that I suppose you could say she's, you know, walking with the rest. Whoever really, you know, there's probably a real guardian that, and she's just on top of it. She's the public figure on it. In the subject matter of the trust, which is our trust, that it doesn't exist because we haven't expressed it yet, but it's still there. And they cannot substitute, so they cannot commingle it, so they, 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 it's still there without the consent of those interested, and the interested are us. And the only thing we expressed to begin with was a debt credit relation instead of a trust relation. So which which one exists? The well, debt credit relation exists. Right now the debt of credit, yeah, everybody will can admit to that. Everybody recognizes the debt of credit one, even though they may not know debt of, what debt of credit means. These people that are stuck in the D.C. realm, they don't agree with that. I don't think they've got the right. They don't understand anything because they're not looking at it through trust eyes. They're not looking at it through through equity. That's right. Now you hit it. They're not looking at equity. They've got spectacles that they need to put on because they're 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 nearsighted. They're short sighted. I know a bunch of old timers, and um, I was listening to them last night. In other words, they don't have the discernment. They don't to discern the garbage that they're reading. Yep. Because they really don't have trust eyes. They don't have I, I, didn't, I didn't have them either until last summer, you know. Last summer you were talking about this really big time. And um, I started and we went into a lot of the public versus private, the general versus special, which is the beginning of this article tonight uh, from the mm-hmm. section we read in Lewin. Talked, just started off right off the bat talking about at law and equity. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, I've been with you on the call, you know, since you started. I heard you. And I'm going to have to re you. I'm the kind that needs to hear it slowly. You know, this is Texas. We're slow. <laughs> I mean, it's probably very true. But, you know, I, I have, you know, doing it that way is better for me. And other people, they probably, you know, they they bingo right away. And that's good. The more people that bingo right away, maybe the quicker we can start changing things in America slowly. But, you know, what the questions I was asking you is important because, to me because I, I have uh, an objection, an object that I want to arrive to. and uh, uh, But I do, you know, I didn't want to, because, uh, you know, pretty soon I'll be an old, well, I'll just be old. I don't want to do nothing. I, I'm just thinking, I might not even reach that age. But the point is that as I do my walking and talking, I've got to keep on going and helping people. And maybe if uh, we can generate uh, several classes from east to west and all the way to the gents, you know, um, that that's going to do a lot of good. It can only do good, Kristen. And I think I think we I'm starting to see time. You know, uh, I'm last year I don't think I saw it. I thought this is it. They're gonna just shut everything down and they're gonna you know put the gun on us. And that's the way some of the old timers were talking. So I kind of saw it, but now I see something different. I see something opening up that uh, you know lots of folks are just you know they're they're looking and searching for the truth, much more than ever. So I really see the uh, technology, and for those people that don't know what the word means, they should look it up because it doesn't mean, you know, you're 
your, your phone, <laughs> your computer. It means it's a it's a word that's very expansive. But your I see the light increasing and the light being the knowledge. So yeah. Well, you know, you're you're show, you're flashing the light, and uh, other people are mirroring it. And that's what needs to grow. It's growing. I see it. And anyway, I had to ask you that question because I don't want to co-mingle. And at the same time, I don't want to destroy uh, uh, someone's... Uh, yeah, but you can't uh, stop somebody else from co-mingling. It's their own choice. And then they got to do it in their own age of majority. Well, when, when I start doing this, I yeah. know that they'll wake up... <clears throat> No, they'll wake up, and I'm going to be standing around them long enough to wake them up, point them in the right direction, but they'll still have to unwake them. helps get you out of your immediate problem, but your immediate problem is not your major problem. Your major problem is you don't know what you're doing, and you're going to commingle. You've been commingling all your life. You've been creating all this debt, contributing to the millstone getting bigger and bigger around everybody's neck to eventually it's all going to sink us. Yeah. And we got to come to realization of that fact, and I need to stop doing the debt of credit realm, period, because that's what our major problem is. Not that they're taking my car or they're foreclosing on my house today. The bigger the problem is the same problem, and that's the, that's the one that nobody really looks at because they're all trying to solve their own problem in their own selfish desire. Well, you always, always really have those. Selfish is after you solve your problem, you go back into the DC realm and do the same thing that you tried to come out from. And go out and get another loan or buy another house or create all this more debt. You know, that's that's a disgusting thing. So that definitely makes it for a selfish motive just to get out of your own problem. In the private the Christian... big picture, and wanting to get rid of it all. And believe me, private... everybody's in the box thinking, and they're not thinking outside the box because they don't see a solution on how to get out of how to operate without commerce. But you don't need commerce. You can operate fine without it. You just got to start thinking outside the box. I agree. <laughs> uh, the only uh, thing I wanted to say was uh, that in the private, knowing that there's no contracts, I guess it would just be a, a gentleman's agreement, right? Uh, yeah. Well, it could be agreement or contract, you know, yeah. Uh, but it can't be under, say, common law because common law doesn't exist because there's no money, no no lawful money. Right. Okay, I, I'm thinking in the right direction. You know, I, I probably still need to, you know, refresh and brush up. You, you answered my question very well, and I thank you for that. And I'll back off for someone else, Kristen, and uh, may the Lord... Continue to bless you, my friend. Okay. Thanks, Albert. Talk to you later. Appreciate that. Right. Thanks, Albert. I enjoyed listening to that. Uh, next <laughs> caller. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Christian. Oh, I didn't say anything. Oh, maybe that was Albert. Uh, next caller that uh, I, I I don't know what happened, but I I got disconnected, and then Albert started talking. But uh, Zyku had... Um, uh, requested to talk. Thank you. Are you still out there? Can you hear us? You've been unmuted. One other person. How smart, but how smart dropped off. Thank you. Last call. You're still with us. I see him out here active and listening. Anybody else have a question for Christian? Sorry. Hello. Oh, there you are. Yeah, we're here. All right. I tried to unmute you before Albert. Somehow uh, he jumped in and 
So I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask your question. Okay. We just wanted to talk with Christian about the hypothetical bankruptcy case. Okay. All right. Uh, we went to uh, today for the uh, the hearing, I guess, hearing or trial, and the judge decided to convert the 13 to Chapter 7. Uh, he made some other interesting uh, statements in the course of his conversation, uh, <clears throat> one being that uh, the court would not allow the in-camera hearing. The bankruptcy court is open to the public and all trusts are public, does not recognize pi private nature of trust, sees no application, no legal ac application. Right. And you needed to be able to connect the dots and the yep. theories of trust. Uh, he asked, are those from the Internet? Withholding the term, uh, he said he was withholding the dec uh, determination of the existence of the trust. Uh, he said that the uh, declaratory judgment was not properly presented and could be brought up at a later time, but he was not going to do the uh, declaratory judgment because it wasn't properly presented. Okay. That means it's deficient in some way. Uh -huh. Missing something, I'll bet you. Either a form process or procedure or something. Uh huh. Well, we we figured that whatever we've done, we've done it all wrong. <laughs> because uh, we didn't get uh, what we thought, uh, you know, there was no acknowledgement of the trust, nothing. And he said that bankruptcy is a uh, uh, relief, and that's where he would determine the validity of the trust, but he's saying that that's defective in some way, and I really can't give you a judgment on the validity of the trust. So that's, that's, uh, the that's stumbling going, block, and that's, that's what I thought was the stumbling block all, all along. Yeah. Now the question is, what is the missing elements necessary to make this move forward? <clears throat> yeah. Well, he went through a whole litany. He's read off 15 different things on here about uh, all the things, bad things that uh, dastardly deeds that have been done. But yet he didn't throw it out. He he had the option of throwing it out of the bankruptcy or converting it. And he chose the latter. He also said that all of the pleadings could be resubmitted in the Chapter 7 bankruptcy court. Uh, okay. So, now, is he telling us something cryptically here that, uh, hey, guys, I'm going to give you another chance to get this correct? Yeah. This may be a withdrawal from, say, the Chapter 13 general into a redeposit as special and under the disguise of Chapter 7. So Chapter 7 could be colorable for the special deposit. So it's well, not we, like giving you the second chance to make the, the uh, corrections and do it over again on that side. Uh-huh. Well, uh, whenever he took it out of Chapter 7 or 13 and put it in Chapter 7, uh, we... He implied that it's a clean slate. Everything starts over. And he dismissed all of them. He, he said all of the other motions that the ADF and A had put in were now moot, like the strict compliance and all that stuff was all moot. Okay, clean slate going all over, starting again. Uh, another issue that uh, in... I, I, I guess you had a chance to listen to his ruling. One of the rulings that he did on the 23rd of November was 
that he he wanted or he he issued an order that there be a more definite statement. Now we're we're asking ourselves: Do we go ahead and put that in, or what does that apply to? Well, I would think that if he said everything else is moot for them, it's probably moot for you also. So if everything is a new, and then he's telling you to resubmit. So if you did a resubmittal, that would be a, a, a more definite statement. You could come back in and change things around and make it a little more definite, yeah. Oh. Should we go ahead and do the first thing in the new in the new chapter seven is do discovery and ask for all the parties interested parties to bring forth their claims with uh, bona fide signature contracts? Yeah, I think I think since you started, we've uh, revamped the model a little bit because we started out uh, number one, the bill in equity is the as the counterclaim. And then we started adding A through wherever, and now we have A through K. Yep. So A, 1A is foundation for the trust, the, the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why, uh, B, the element of the trust, uh, C, the declaratory relief, and that would be the hearing to prove the validity of the trust, and E, the bill of discovery for proof of the rights in equity under pleading special matters, and those pertaining to the rights in the bill of equity. And F would be the exhibits incorporated, <laughs> excuse me, incorporated herein by reference. And G, relief asked for uh, the performance and anything else. And H would be the enjoining action to freeze the at-law side and I, the subpoena for discovery of documents and the deuces tecum in an impersonum action on the man and not the, not the fiction. And uh, the protective order or sealing the case. And then the K, the last one, was the concurrent, uh, the motion to dismiss the at-law side for the lack of equity in an ancillary uh the secondary suit. And that sounds like what he did on his own is really he, he dismissed the 13, really, probably for the lack of the equity, and converted it to the 7, which would be colorable, but would give you a second chance to re-enter and come in firsthand and file refile as a beginning all over again under equity. And making it more particular, the bill in equity, more specific. What else did he say? Anything else? He said there was a whole string of things. That... Yeah, he said a lot of things. Uh, I, try, I jotted down as many as I could. Uh, we, we, we thought decided he was probably talking to the public. I'll go through some of the the, the sins that were yeah, the hypothetical sins. Uh, one, the uh, bankruptcy was filed just before the closure of the business. Two, the plan does not comport to 1325 for uh, bankruptcy code. Payments were made with worthless paper, debt title series. Didn't understand that. Number four, no basis for uh, no basis in law for the debt titles, extinguishment of debt. Number five, debt titles are not money. Uh, number six, the wife didn't appear at the hearing. Number seven, uh, was the actual selling of the business or the transfer of the business completed? Number eight. Schedules are in, inaccurate with omissions. Number nine, bank accounts were not listed. Number ten, no listing of uh, secured creditors. 
Number 11, Schedule I was blank, no income. Number 12, didn't list the safe from which that silver came from, stored, or where the silver was stored that uh, paid for that or bought the or, or the business was sold for 21 pieces of silver. Number 13, foreclosure was not listed. Number 14, operating business without license because it's paid in trust. Number 15, fiduciary duties to the state to collect taxes were not being uh, completed. So those are the 15 reasons why he could have thrown it out. Mm-hmm. But he did. Yeah. Then he said it was. Uh, he did a conversion because maybe bankruptcy fraud. Wanted to see if the business can be sold. May not happen. Uh, stay goes away. Conveyance was it made? Is it a fraudulent conveyance? Uh, this is a scheme. This whole trust thing is a scheme. No basis in law. And raised equity basis for claim. Then he proceeded to say that, oh, uh, how could someone come in asking for equity when he wasn't doing equity? So he used one of the maxims. And he was saying that because the the debtor, uh, the debtor was using uh, merged titles to pay his debt, that he wasn't doing equity. Oh, yeah, and he gave two cases to support his claim that this was a scheme. There were two court cases, and one of them was uh, uh, David M. Tuttle and Billy G. Tuttle, plaintiffs versus Chase Mortgage, Chase Home Finance, LLC, Lennox Financial Mortgage, LLC, Lindbergh and Associates, Randall uh, A. Covington, and Henry M. Paulson. Yeah, case number 2.08-CV-574, November 17, 2008. And then another one, uh, Jonathan, or United States of America plaintiff versus Jonathan N. Gilly, defendant. Number 1, colon, 08 dash CR-37, June 5th, 2009. And one of these involved a person who was writing uh, uh, his own negotiable instruments, and they decided that he needed to go to jail for four or five years to contemplate what he was doing. And the other one was a Mr. Gilly. Uh, uh, I didn't read all of the other ones. Oh, yeah, it's talking about redemption. And he kept saying that this was a scheme about redemption. Mm -hmm. But we were wondering if he wasn't talking to the public so that, you know, the room was had four or five, maybe six lawyers in there. Try looking up the cases, see if you can find them. Yeah, he gave them to us. We gave you the cases? Yes. He printed them off and gave them to us. But they have, they absolutely have nothing to do with anything that was discussed in the case, except whenever he talked about it being uh, some kind of a scheme, and uh, did that come off the Internet, and uh, was it some kind of redemption? I think they're trying to colorably call call it redemption. Yeah, we kind of think maybe that's what he's doing. Is kind of speaking to the sheep with redemption, no? But he said that the 
all of this stuff about the trust and paying your debt and trust and all that was gobbledygook. Uh, at law, yeah, and he's right, and that's where he's coming from. Yeah, definitely he's coming from that law. Yeah. But he's also so, saying equitable things there, which leaves the door open. Uh, I, I think this guy knows what's, what you're trying to do and is, is actually trying to help you out. Otherwise, he probably would have, you know. Who did this out? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, our strategy. Do the bill in equity and do have all the elements discovered and everything? Yeah, the, the strategy is to take the key that we've got as it stands now and to file some new notches in it and see whether or not we get the key to work in the in the in the lock because that's what the problem is. We just don't have quite what uh what he needs to see to invoke equity and get to that declaratory relief hearing in chambers. So that w- the declar the declaratory relief is in chambers then, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you get a chance to go on the uh, the Skype chat, or NTT chat last night, and, and look what I posted in there? Uh, yeah, so I'll see if you'd read part of it. I haven't had a chance. Yeah, there's some stuff in there that I kind of posted, and uh, what? I think it was Tuesday. What night was that? Yeah, it was. Last night I revealed the uh, motion to dismiss how it's, how it's functioning in, in a duality. It right. actually is using it as a transfer. Uh huh. The question is, how many people know that? Probably nobody. <laughs> They're always uh, that's one of the first <laughs> things they do is a uh, motion to dismiss. Well, I did that today. Oh, yeah, Dole did a parole uh, motion to uh, withdraw the case and for lack of equity, for lack of equity, equity and to uh, order the clerk to uh, enter the case back in on the equitable side of the court. Uh, what did they say then? Denied. <laughs> yeah, because so, basically everything I put in the uh, Skype chat last night was everybody was getting shut down uh, with their equitable cases and they were getting it transferred back to the at law side because they didn't have the very basics that they needed to get equity to recognize that they had an equitable claim. Something is missing that we we just don't have our fingers on yet, which is the adjustment of the key notches that will open the door. Yeah. And we just, we just don't quite have it yet. Uh, I was reading last night on the uh, some of the cases there where they were actually entering them in on the uh, uh, the equity side. And then they were uh, immediately going for, I forget, uh, it wasn't summary judgment, but it was uh, some other kind of judgment, whether it was declaratory judgment, I believe it might have been. And uh, that was based solely on uh, the, the master of the roles or the, the master uh, that was appointed. And he was doing the in-camera examination of the evidence in support of the uh, the finding of probably whether or not it's going to head into equity and equity is going to take jurisdiction. So what they were doing is that what he was uh, evidence he was going by was the the way the pleading was drafted, the bill in equity, and the opposition's answer to that pleading. Because the answers would be the admissions, whether they admitted or denied, 
uh, the the the, uh, the bill in equity, the the questions in the equity. So I, I think it's the the strength is for jurisdiction to be taken in equity. It's the draftsmanship or the drafting of the bill in equity. And there's where I think our skill weaknesses is down on because it's in those drafting of the admissions that are in there and comporting to the averment stated. So when the opposition answers, if they deny or admit, if they admit, then they're actually admitting and, and your what you put in your averment in your bill and that's what the master is looking for. So I think it's in the the key is in the development of the notches in the key is the draftsmanship in the bill and that's where I think our weakness is. Just on the very basics of the uh elemental composition of the the drafting of the bill. So that equity can take jurisdiction, or that we can get in and get a declaratory relief on the validity of the trust. Because the equity taking jurisdiction is almost synonymous with the validity of the trust. The one one gives the other. Yeah. So. Uh, so I think. Question. The focus needs to be on the the, the basics of how to draft a, a, a proper bill. And that, I think that ties in with what the judge was saying, too. Because if he wants more particulars as to, you know, it seems like you need to restate something. And he doesn't have what he needs there to turn the switch on for equity. I've been reading a lot of these cases, and these cases, you know, are not actually showing the actual uh, bills, but they're given the the opinions from the case. And what we really need to do is, like I was telling uh, Darren last night, that we need to do, uh, like in the 1980s, find a, a bill in equity that was successful and then actually get a hold of the bill and get one closer to, say, 1933 post and then get one pre-1933, and then compare all three of those bills as to how they've kind of evolved through the history and see what changes have been made. Because I know in 1954 they changed, uh, in Florida here, they went from, uh, they went to the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure But yet the equity uh, rules were still in play. And sometime since the 50s there, then we've totally lost touch of the equity realm and the rules of equity. And I don't know what that's been codified, recodified in the statutes here or or whether it's still been in play and just everybody lost it because it just faded from their minds because nobody was using it. Because once they put into play the, the civil rules, everybody came in through the civil rules side, which was the at-law side, and equity seemed to, like, disappear from then on. And those cases were pointing out at that time prior to then it was, there were two kinds of dockets. There was the at-law side docket and the equity side docket. And the clerk was responsible for entering in on the correct docket. Well, he talked about, uh, in his uh, dissertation, he talked about there being, uh, at one time, two courts, and that in the around 1954, I think he said that they were merged. And he kind of implied that once they were merged, there was no more equity, uh, as we knew it. <coughs> now, he was speaking in, in public, at the public. Right, right. But we know from that... Uh, court case in 1988 where the judge who wrote the, uh, that uh, ruling 
stated that, uh, yes, indeed, there had been a merger, but there was no nothing in the, the Constitution that did away with the equitable court. Right, the Maxi Center case, yeah. Hutchinson versus Maxi Center. There still is two courts within the one court, the equity court and the the at-law court. But it's just now, how do we? Uh, and I, I think I really think it's in the in the bill and equity how it's drafted and how it's put, whether or not it's put in right from the beginning. Right. I think he was telling us that and actually doing you doing your favor by saying, okay, I've got to convert this case, call it clean slate. It's starting over from beginning, and now if these guys can put it in right the first time, and then they can invoke the equity side. So probably in the, within the next few days, they need to put in our uh, equitable pleading. Build equity. Yes. Uh huh. Would it? Would it be? Uh, you think that if we went to the uh, law library and enlisted the help of some of those new and upcoming lawyers to uh, locate some of these bills and equity, you think we could get them to do that? Uh, you could try. Of course, being Christmas, they're probably all gone. But. Um, um, you know, if we need to find like a successful equity, equity case in a specific time frame, say in the 1980s, and, and in order to get the case, you probably have to find out where it was particularly filed and then have to probably write to the actual court and get a copy or uh, of the actual, off of the microfish. The actual pleadings? Yeah, the actual pleadings, yeah. Now, that could be maybe done uh, by telephone, uh, but you'd first have to find out, you know, where was the case brought up first. Yeah. You have to go directly to that court. Because they should still have the records of that. I mean, I haven't seen anybody pull up uh, an actual bill in equity yet and say, I found one. Yeah, it's kind of like him, Steve. If you go by that Maxi Center case on footnote 10, it gives you a, a decreasing uh, number since the high point being in the 30s to where its its last one was 1980s in Florida where that was only one case in the 1980s that was a true equity case. And from then on, uh, supposedly, there there were none. Yeah. And then I think the true equity is disappeared from everyone's mind, and clerks have never seen an equity case since then. If you probably asked them to file it on the, the, the equity docket, they'd probably look at you and say, what's that? <laughs> yep. Clerk might not even know what it is. Well, I think we've got some revamping to do on that, and uh, I think it's important that we find anybody out there listening if they could do the the finding of an actual bill in equity. Might be critical in the uh, success here. So apparently, if it were closer, he would have shut us down. We're thinking that uh, we must be pretty close, or he would have gone ahead and just shut us down. I think so. Yeah. So apparently, we're you know we're on the right track. We not we're not they're quite good enough to get the get through the doorway, but you know I think we're right at the door. Yep.
Anything else? Anyway, he talks real ugly to the public. It seems to be. Yeah, well, what he says and what he's done has been two different things. Yeah. Well, we'll continue trying to uh, find that uh, proper equitable pleading. Okay, I enlist the aid of anybody out there listening that could uh, scrounge up an actual equitable, equitable case that mimics the old style bill in equity. You need to see an actual complaint yep. or an actual bill in equity. <clears throat> And then if you could uh, stick it in the NTT chat group that you've come up with something and let's let's all examine it. Okay. Would you be averse to the to our writing up uh, our uh, concept of the bill and equity and then send it to you and have you to critique it a little bit? Yeah, I'll take a look at it. Yep. Okay. That might be the thing to do so that whenever we turn this one in, they wouldn't get it as correct as possible. Well, this might be a, a kind of a trial and error thing, so I don't know. If it's, yep. So we get it just exactly right. Okay, anything else, guys? Uh, no, you have anything? No, we appreciate it. All right. We, we thought maybe you, you would like to know. Yeah, of course. More failures make more success. Yeah, yeah. We all spent a lot of time on this, so. Like now it's the, uh, the the NTT thing is complete, but it's the, okay, how do we get the NTT into the court now, so into equity? That's the next step. So. How do we get them to recognize it? Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Since we spent a, a year over a year developing NTT, and now we got to develop the court thing, so. Well, hopefully they won't take us out and shoot us before we figure this out. I hope so, too. <laughs> well, if everybody would pitch in and say, hey, you know, just focus on the uh, uh, the maxims and the actual, uh, actual bill in equity, what one looks like. Well, if we were to the, if we were to go to the law school and ask the uh, young upcoming lawyers to look for a, a bill in equity, would they even know what we were talking about? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> what I'm afraid of. Okay, if that's it, guys, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go for tonight. We appreciate your time. Any closing comments, Christian? No, I just put an outreach there for everyone that's listening. That uh, if they've got access to documents, uh, do some searches and see if you can pull up what we're looking for here. We need we need a, an actual example of a bill in equity case. Uh, several different ones throughout the years. One like pre 1933. One close, uh, a post-1933 right after that, and then probably one in, say, the 1950s, and probably, say, one in, say, 2000 or so. 
so we could see how they transitioned. If anybody has access to that, they can search. <clears> that would be greatly appreciated amongst all of us. And then post it out on the uh, Skype group? Yeah, the NTT Skype chat, yeah. Hey, Christian, what page did we end up on tonight in uh, the uh, tree book? That was page uh, 797. 797, okay. Folks, Looking we'll pick up, up there 39. on page 797 next week at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Wednesday night. So until then, everybody have a great week, Christian. Thank you again. It's always right. a pleasure. And we will hook back up in a week. Okay, man. Thanks. Okay. Good night, folks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Night, Christian. Night, all.